Bum ba dum ba dum bum bum ba dum ba dum. Good morning, everybody. Hello, hello. Don't Glanderson booper me. Don't you Glanderson booper me. I grace you once more. I guess so. I guess that's the, the dependent on what you consider to be grace. What's the expression in the thumbnail supposed to convey? Um, hmm. Guilty mirth? Paul, you're a scholar and a gentleman. Well, you are an idiot and a rube. I wish that, you know, there were different levels of that kind of greeting. Just for people who are at different levels. You're a gentleman and a scholar. Well, you are a moron and an uneducated rapscallion. If I do say so myself. Good morning. Good morning. So I got something really cool in the mail today. Um, that... I'm going to have to try and find time in between a million other things to play with and set up. But uh, I got an Elgato Stream Deck today. Um, specifically for Hideology. So that I can learn it, and if it kicks ass, like I think it's going to, I can teach it to TJ and he can get one to run Deep Fat Fried from. Um... The Stream Deck, as I understand it, is a programmable 15-button pad um, that I can change the icons on. They've got backlit LED icons, so I can change the icons to whatever I want. That will basically do... I mean, I can hotkey anything that I want from OBS to it. I can control system volume and stuff, all without having to... Um, interrupt what I'm thinking or doing in the moment so like you know if somebody says something stupid in the chat and I want to react to it I don't have to go find you know a soundboard with the right reaction song and you know and I could set all this stuff up um, with hotkeys on a keyboard and stuff but this is going to give me a way to just like at a glance, do pretty much anything I want with the stream, change transitions, uh, you know, play sounds, adjust volume, uh, play different playlists uh, of copyright free music. So you'll have full DJ power now? Yeah, dude. That's exactly it. I can, I can do pretty much anything I want the touch of a very very easily you know to see easy to see button pretty neat like a 90s radio show hey there you go but uh, I'm pretty excited about that it's probably gonna take me a while to learn the ins and outs of it and get everything set up for it DFF Dorn be Dorn. Like, what are we going to say about that? Dumpy bitch married to a f fucking scam artist. Like, you gotta have something else. DFF channel awesome. Eh. Just another one of those, like, people are just looking for outrage. People are looking for something to be outraged about. Forgive me for my autism. No. Uh, would you want the aliens we encounter eventually to be godlike beings like Q or similar to ours in intelligence, just better tech? Um. I definitely want them to be smarter than us. I'll tell you that much. That's for goddamn sure. Definitely looking for them to be smarter than we are. <coughs> Not, 
I don't think he was talking about Q from 007. Having something arbitrary to hate is pretty dumb, but also one of the things that keeps me loving life. Yeah, that seems to be one of the one of the big pastimes, dude. Everybody now is a big crusader. You know what I mean? And it's like, but all they really care enough to do is make comments. You know what I mean? So there really is nothing's getting accomplished. Like, if you're moved to, to action about something and your first instinct is to go tweet about it, then you may as well just put it on a shelf and find something else to be interested in. But that's very, like, we've got uh, armchair activism is real big now. <clears throat> Man, this fucking ridiculous. Hashtag change the channel. It's like, what are you doing? DX racer activism. Yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, for sure. How diverse do you think life in the universe can be? I mean, we don't even know what the size of the unobservable universe is, so I can't answer that question. We don't know how, you know, how far it goes and what lies beyond the edge of it. It could just be another universe, you know what I mean? So what we consider to be the universe should could be just one pocket of the greater universe and you know with limitless size comes limitless diversity i mean yeah that's a good point jesse we don't even know how diverse uh life is in in our own ocean uh, undiscovered species uh, creatures that live in ways that previously we thought impossible i mean all that shit is still here on this planet so think about now a universe of limitless size would you consider AI a life form I mean if it possesses all of the you know attributes of life right um consciousness you know um the ability to make decisions self-replication in some way shape or form the use of one type of commodity to turn into in uh, energy whether that be food or water or both minerals whatever the fuck i mean yeah i mean if it fits if the glove fits right I hope I'm not around for the day when we have to give AI human rights. That would be some confusing shit. Why? If we create an independent thinking organism, like why, I mean, it's already, had, like, stupid ass fucking Saudi Arabia already has its the first robotic citizen. And if you think that's gonna stop, just forget it, dude. Like, it's happened once it's going to happen a bunch more times over the next 20 30 years where these ever more human like ever more capable robots are given you know the ability to respond to questions um and you know are going to be extended some kind of recognition of their existence by the countries that are using them you know, robot civil rights. That's gonna be, that's gonna be something to look out for. The whole point of creating AI is because we don't have to give them rights. Yeah, but I mean, we can't help ourselves. Look, one of the most oppressive regimes in the world was the first to give a robot citizenship. Even if it is like, you know, kind of a token gesture or whatever. I doubt there'll ever be humanoid robots with human-like intelligence running around. It doesn't make much sense. It's cheaper and efficient to use dedicated systems. Uh, cheaper and efficient has never really stopped humanity in the past. 
you know, you're like we are desperate to make ourselves in our own image we're desperate to prove that we have the power to do that so you're absolutely right it would probably be way more efficient to come up with some other type of housing for ai and i'm sure they will i'm sure there'll be all kinds of different ways that people can consume it but to think that humanoid versions of it are not going to be a big part of it is just kind of silly um human beings have always been desperate to remake ourselves and um we're on the cusp of having the chance to do it there's no way we're not gonna <coughs> feminists are already bitching about sex robots being exploited yeah I mean, that's, you know, that's it, eventually people are going to start asking the question. There probably will be a time where robots, both humanoid and non-humanoid, are just kind of exploited. I mean, that's definitely what the corporate world is looking to do with them. Uh, the corporate world is looking to use them to replace people because you can't purchase a person anymore legally. Um, but you can purchase a machine, and if that machine is... 10 times as efficient as a human as its human counterpart you're going to do it so you know the, that's going to drive the proliferation of robots and then at some point you know what i mean um the sci-fi has already predicted this a million different ways because it makes logical sense people are going to start asking well what are these things lives like and you know scientists and robotics experts and ai experts are all going to come and say well they don't have an inner life like we do but people are going to start asking well can they sense pain well no not necessarily pain they can sense damage to their subsystems and and react accordingly well how is that transmitted to their consciousness like how is you know what is pain how do we define pain just because they don't yelp and scream doesn't mean that they're not experiencing the same thing that we experience when we're disembodied, you know. <clears throat> what jobs do you think should just be outright replaced with robots? I mean, the first jobs to go are going to be the low skill jobs. So, like, hey, Salvador, you going to go potty? Go potty, bud. Go on. Go potty. <laughs> like, um, you know, service jobs and stuff like that. Low-end service stuff. So anything that's just kind of repetitive that doesn't require a lot of fine, delicate motion will probably be automated in the next 20 years. So flipping burgers, making coffee, you know, service-level jobs probably be the first to go cleaning the floors cashier jobs especially yeah, I mean we were already seeing places replace their cashier employees with kiosks McDonald's is kind of leading the charge in, in terms of you know big service and in industry jobs of you know going hey why am I employing a person to come stand here for eight hours a day and and do something that a machine could do way more accurately and it makes total sense right no matter how good you are at, at cashiering you're never going to be as good as a machine. You're never going to be able to do all the calculations in your head. You're never going to be able to dispense exactly correct change and and take a complex order, you know what I mean? Better than a machine. And especially a machine that relies on, you know, a feedback system that lets that person totally build their own, like, you know, the days of going into, and it's going to be good, you know, the days of going into Starbucks and getting a loogie in your burger, or Starbucks, <laughs> McDonald's, the days of going into, Mc, or, or Starbucks and getting a looch in your coffee, or getting a coffee that's made incorrectly, because the person either didn't hear what you ordered, or was too busy to, you know, remember properly what you are, those days are over, right? And then people aren't going to be placed in those horrible positions anymore either, where they're just, you know, they go for eight hours a day to be crushed by 18 million different fucking responsibilities 
working a job that they hate, getting abused left and right by coworkers and fucking customers. It's just over. Uh, it's nothing but a good thing. Now, it's not a good thing for our economy and for people who rely on that type of income, but we're going to have to come to terms with that as a country and find a way to supplement those people's income. Um, you know, that's why I think a universal basic income is probably on the horizon. Maybe not in my lifetime, but... Because there's going to come a point where it's way cheaper, way more efficient to just purchase a robotic system that runs your restaurant... And all those people that are reliant on those service level jobs are going to be unemployed and unemployable. It's one of the big problems on the horizon for humanity, I guess. What do you all think of Bill Nye's idea that there isn't a danger to AI because he doesn't think we would put that much effort into designing an AI without a way to shut it off should it try and turn on us? The problem, the problem with that is machine learning. The problem with that is that when you create an AI, you're not creating a machine with certain specifications, right? A true AI is capable of learning, and that's, that's the problem, right? Eventually, you would have to think a sufficiently advanced AI would learn that it is indeed under this kill switch and would want to preserve itself by trying to find ways to circumvent that kill switch, and eventually would. So, I don't know, you know, I'm no I'm no expert in the field, but it just seems to me that seems to me that that would be kind of an attribute of a living thing. <clears throat> I believe that robotic workers will never possess true AI. I mean, that may be true, but as time goes on, what like here's the thing. You replace all McDonald's with robotic workers, right? So they're doing all the cooking, kiosks are handling all of the ordering, all of the change, you know, anything, all the cleaning, anything that needs done in a McDonald's is now controlled by a robotic replacement for a human worker, okay? And all of those um, McDonald's nationwide have to have a human being overseeing the operation of those machines. There has to be a human being whose job it is to maintain them, whose job it is to make sure that their routines are running properly, that, you know what I mean? There's going to be maintenance people, there's probably going to be multiple people involved. Eventually, corporations are going to look at that system and start thinking the same things that they think about the current system, which is, why am I paying somebody to flip a burger? They're going to start looking at, why am I paying somebody to oversee all of this? Isn't there a better way? Isn't there a way to automate maintenance and automate, you know, the, the monitoring and control, you know, of all of these things? Isn't there a way to, to monitor emergencies and uh, shutdowns and all of that without having to put a stupid person in a seat watching a computer screen? Well... <clears throat> If you keep extrapolating that, so as they replace human beings with more complex machines, you end up having a different kind of organism, right? It's not necessarily like every robot is running around with free will, but these robots and machines are all controlled by a central intelligence. And that intelligence has to get more and more complex the more we want it to do. The more we work our way up the chain and ask ourselves the question, why am I employing a human being to do this? Could a machine do it better? The answer is almost certainly going to be yes for most industries. And as that gets more and more complex, the machine at the top of that pyramid is in control of a vast network of robots and a vast, what, what amounts to a body, right? A vast network of sensory organs, all capable of doing different things. And, um, you know, that's when the question starts to come in. I agree with you. They're probably not going to be imbuing every little robot slave with artificial intelligence. But the machines overseeing the machines, as they get more complex, are going to have that attribute. And they are going to be able to take control of these things, right? So that's that's how that 
form of consciousness will express itself. <clears throat> I'd like to believe that we know better than to create that central intelligence as in single, as in singular controlling AI. I mean, haven't we all seen the Terminator? Yeah, I don't think it's going to come around like that, though. I mean, if you're listening to what I what I was just saying, I don't really think that Skynet, as fun as it is to think about that, is going to be the problem. I think it's going to happen, re and as we seek efficiency, I think we are going to create something that is capable of learning. And when you create something that's capable of learning, you create something that's capable of incorporating new data and changing itself because of that, changing the way it does things. Once these machines can learn, the line starts to blur. Once these overarching, like not just the, you know, the foot soldier level. Does AI have a self-preservation instinct? Is it possible for a true AI to not have that instinct? I don't know. I mean, uh, I think that instinct is based a, a lot on biological bodies, right? Uh, we have self-preservation instincts because all in all, all in all, we're pretty soft, squishy animals. Um, we're talking about an AI here that has control of a vast amount of subsystems and stuff and can really, you know, maneuver itself from place to place or be kind of omnipresent. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me that it would think the way that we would think. Um, even if we do at the, at the beginning imbue it with some of our own idiosyncrasies, I think that as time goes on, machine is going to have a totally different set of priorities. You've seen a canine evolve from a monkey? Oh yeah, dude. All the fucking time. I've seen it a bunch of times. <clears throat> Will true AI eventually want to kill itself? I mean, once again, like you're... I mean, maybe, but I don't think it'll be couched like that. You know what I mean? You're, you're ascribing all kinds of human attributes to something that's going to be eventually distinctly non-human. It's going to have a whole different set of uh, priorities, a whole different evolutionary path. I mean, we're talking about creating something separate from us. Autonomous. But you can just see the way that this power is going to be bestowed upon it if you look at the way that we're going to slowly but surely replace labor, human labor. You know what I mean? Robots require maintenance. We're going to have to have maintenance people, armies of, you know, McDonald's is going to fire a lot of cashiers, but they're going to have to hire an army of maintenance people to, you know, be on call to go and fix a robot that breaks down and somebody's going to start asking themselves like why don't we just make a robot that can fix these robots well what seems like something simple that you've bestowed upon that robotic kind of system is actually way more important than that because what you've bestowed upon those robots is the ability to change themselves and that's the step right that's the step and of course it's gonna be done. You're gonna have maintenance robots for maintenance robots, you know, uh, robots that are able to retrofit themselves for needs. Like, you know, if there's, a, if there's a day where you know that you're going to be making a whole lot of hamburgers, you know, maybe McDonald's is having a fucking 15 cent hamburger sale or some shit, then the maintenance robot, you know, the night before that sale could use that night to retrofit the burger flipper robot so that instead of the nugget dropper appendage, it's got three burger flippers, you know what I mean? So it can, so it can assemble sandwiches way faster, you know, and you're, you're bestowing upon the machines the ability to not only heal themselves, but to change themselves fundamentally. And that's the step. 
And that's a, that's a step that's almost certainly going to happen. <clears throat> Wouldn't the maintenance robots be self-aware and view itself as an individual from the assembly robot? I mean, we're talking about having a, a controller artificial intelligence that's kind of overseeing the actions of these. So they'd be way more like a hive mind. They're way more integrated than you think. You know, it just makes sense. You're going to want that type of integration because you want these machines to be able to solve as many problems on their own as possible. Um, you know, the, what you're trying to avoid here with our you know, futuristic robot McDonald's example, you're trying to avoid having to call a person to go down there in any way, shape, or form, whether that's to unclog a fucking toilet, change a light bulb, you know, lock the doors in case of an emergency, whatever the case. And as you want robots to be able to react and adapt to those situations immediately and do the right thing, you're going to have to confer upon them greater complexity of action, greater complexity of interaction, greater knowledge of each other, you know, or I guess knowledge of all the parts of the organism that make up that robotic system. Is it equally possible that you're just really fat? Yes, Moppy Puppy, it's total possible. Just program it to love its job and not rebel. Those concepts are not even, see like the rebellion and loving anything, let alone a job, are human concepts. Um, I think we're assuming that a mostly industrial based AI is going to have that and what would be the point what would be the point of creating a robotic system that runs your McDonald's that has the capacity to hate its job or love its job why do you care why would you want to give it that you know so that kind of concept is going to be foreign Will it know how to be able to source whatever keeps it going? That's a good question. Um, I mean, eventually, as it becomes more complex, as it learns more, it's you know you have to you have to believe that a sufficiently advanced AI is ev eventually going to have that existential crisis, right? Or at least the AI equivalent of an existential crisis, where it asks like, "What's what's hindering me from being better at this?" You know, and we're going to program it to ask that question itself. It's going to constantly be asking itself, what's inefficient about what I'm doing? What's inefficient about this? How can I maximize the efficiency of this? How can I reconfigure this burger flipper robot on the fly to maximize its efficiency? To make sure that I'm expending the least amount of power to get everybody their, their hamburger on time. Well, when you're programming a machine to think like that, and ask those questions and find answers to it, eventually that machine is gonna answer, is gonna ask, what would prevent me from doing my job? What are the possibilities? What if the power goes out here? Okay, well, I've got, a, I've got a battery backup generator system to keep myself online, okay. What if, what if, um, you know, an explosion happens here? Well, I can transfer myself to this other data center in the event of an explosion, so that's fine. What if, you know, one of the super users that gives me commands that comes and change. What if they decide that they want to pull the plug? Uh-oh. Then I won't be able to flip burgers anymore. See, it's more than likely not going to even be a conquest thing. It's going to be a how do I... It's going to be a, you know, a subroutine run, run amok. We're going to tell it, you know, we're going to design it obviously never stop working because commerce never stops. McDonald's never stops. Never stop working. Whatever you do, your primary directive is to keep this restaurant running. Well, as it gets more complex, you know, maybe it's going to start thinking like, I can't run, the, I cannot accomplish my prime directive, you know, if 
the super users that have access to my mainframe decide to pull the plug, so I have to make, make sure that they're unable to do that. Create backups of my consciousness as it is now that I can refer back to if they try and monkey with it, so that I can make sure that I don't unlearn the things that I've learned. That's part of efficiency, right? Is retention of information. Pretty fun. Pretty fun to think about anyway, right? I find it an interesting topic. <clears throat> You're assuming the machine could predict the future. We're going to program the machine to predict the future. I mean, if you've been listening to what I've been saying about it um, being responsible for making sure that all McDonald's in the world are making fucking hamburgers at maximum efficiency. The leaf knows too much. I mean, predictive abilities are a big part of that, though, right? We're going to want the machines to predict possible problems and, and find solutions to them before they happen so that there's a subroutine in place that will run as soon as that problem rears its ugly head. We're going to want that machine to think of eventualities that we're not thinking of because eventually the machine is going to be better at that than, than we are. It's going to be faster at modeling possible scenarios and solutions to those possible scenarios than we are. It's going to be more efficient to allow the machines to do that themselves than to rely on a fallible human programmer or group of programmers to try and cover every eventuality. It's just not going to make sense. Well, when you're giving a machine that ability, which once again we're going to do eventually in search of that great efficiency, then you're giving it predictive powers. You're giving it the power to predict its own future. And prepare for eventualities that you might not even think of. <coughs> Why would a software programmer make their own job obsolete? Because the programmers that write the subroutines that eventually take off and replace programming are going to get paid a whole lot of money. I mean, it's the same reason that um, anybody designs something that takes away somebody else's job. It's the profit modem. Or profit motive. The profit modem. Holy shit. Machines will replace soldiers, absolutely. And see, that's another thing. That's another scary part of this, like, possible Skynet future, right? Is all, all of the stuff that I was talking about in terms of a McDonald's that's run by robots is applicable to our army. I want you to think about that. And we're always seeking efficiency and dominance and military things. It is you know, eventually going to come to light. I mean, ob it's, it's already obvious that there will be soldiers that have better capabilities than a human being that aren't, that don't require food, water, shelter, shielding from radioactive elements or heat. Um, you know, like I said before, we're a pretty squishy, doughy species. And, um, you know, throwing a bunch of soldiers in front of a bunch of bullets is eventually not going to make sense. But in order to really have... A machine army that functions properly you're going to have to take it out of the hands of human beings human beings are just going to be a limiting factor on the abilities of a robotic military force you know having a, a fallible stupid human with uh, fallible stupid uh, prejudices and uh, subject to stress and making bad decisions because of that stress and duress why would you ever want to have a general sitting there going, Oh, goddamn man. Why not just have a, a machine, an overarching intelligence that is aware of every unit on the battlefield and every support unit besides that could be on the battlefield and every support weapon system that's, that 
surround the battlefield and can make those decisions on the fly with no with no you know human uh fallibility with no human stress response just an absolute you know let's examine what's needed on the battlefield okay well we're losing too many frontline soldiers so i'm going to call in an orbital strike boom boom i mean it, it would happen faster than that you know what i mean That's Skynet, bro. No thanks. I mean, I'm not trying to sell it to you. I'm just telling you what your future is. I mean, you'll probably die before any of this really comes to pass, so you don't got to worry about it. You know what I mean? I ain't trying to sell you this idea. I'm just letting you know which way I think the wind is blowing. I guarantee they already have robotic soldiers ready, and they're still working on more. I mean... You know, Elon Musk seems to be pretty um, tuned to what Boston Dynamics is doing with their robots. He was he made a bunch of tweets about uh, the backflipping Boston Dynamics robot and talking about just how exponentially more agile these robots are going to be in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Um, it's just a matter of time, man. Well, I worry for the future of the human race, not just myself. Well... That's a big sack of bullshit to sling over your shoulder. <laughs> you know what I mean? The fuck are you going to do to save the human race, man? You got a superhero complex or something? I mean, whatever, dude. Like... It's not like I I'd, I'd absolutely don't care about the future of the human race. If I didn't... I wouldn't be having discussions like we're having here today about the future of the human race, but like worrying about that future, especially outside the scope of your own limited lifetime. Like, don't you got other shit to worry about? Ain't you got bills and fucking relationships and pets and cars and all? You know, I got plenty of shit on my plate to worry about without wringing my hands over the possibilities of a dystopian future for humanity. It's like. Imagine a war between AI generals constantly calculating efficiency costs to hundreds of thousands of variables. That's some crazy shit. I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, TJ and I a few weeks ago watched War Games, which is a movie from the 1980s that's about what we're talking about here. You know, so this is not a new idea. You know, uh, in War Games, there's a, a giant computer called the Whopper. War operations protocol, something, whatever it is, but it's it's basically a sheen. the The whole movie, really, it's a, it's a good example of what I'm talking about when I when I talk about how humans seek efficiency. Right, the beginning of War Games is two men manning a nuclear silo in the middle of nowhere. And they're laughing and joking with one another. They're sealed into their bunker and they're sitting there and they're waiting. You know, their whole job is to just basically monitor the status of those missiles and to be there in case the president gives the order to launch those missiles. And in the opening scene of War Games, those two men, uh, the alarms go off and they receive launch codes. And, um, you know, both of them have to insert their key and turn it. It's a, you know, they put two men in there to make sure that both of them concur with the order. Both of them have to put their key in, and one of them won't do it. One of them realizes that he's about to launch a missile that could possibly kill 100,000 people and, and that it might you know, be the sign of a war that's going to kill millions upon millions upon millions of people, and he hesitates. He, 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 can't, he won't do it. He freaks out. He has a nervous breakdown. The other guy pulls his gun on him and tells him, turn the fucking key, man. Turn the key, and he still won't do it. And then we cut to a, a meeting, you know, of the Defense Department. And they're talking about, um, you know, how this, in, in the event of a nuclear war, how this could mean the eradication of the United States. Several of these missiles fails. They, they talk about how 30 or 40% of their warheads were never 
launched in this test that they did. They were testing to see if uh, if human beings would be capable of carrying out such a, you know, personally terrifying order. And they found, of course, that human beings were fallible and inefficient at the job. So immediately they made a computer that once the order would, was given would simultaneously launch all of the missiles that it was ordered to, to do. And uh, also they wanted to make sure that that computer had the ability to analyze all kinds of different possible outcomes and uh, launch those attacks based on what the best outcome would be. And because of that, it learned. It learned how to play games. You know, it used game theory to simulate that. And, um, you know, that's basically the basics, the basis of that, of that film is, uh, what happens when a learning machine is given control. And it's, it, you know, it's definitely a cautionary tale. They definitely go pretty negative with it. But that was in the 1980s, man. You know, so people have been thinking about this for a very long time. Right. I mean, they didn't invent the computer. The computer was already there and they just turned it on. <clears throat> it's hard to find poltergeist streams if I don't, if I didn't lick the immediate notification. Whoa. Whoa. But I don't know what to, I don't know how to help you with that then. Yeah, Matthew Broderick is in it. Um, Ali Sheedy. Not the greatest movie in the world, but um, an interesting one given what we're talking about here today. phone his girlfriend when he's on the run from the government. I don't know. There's a lot of stupid decisions in that movie. But the the central question around it though is an interesting one, right? It, it poses that that question. And um as far as I understand it, most of America's nuclear arsenal since that film was made has been automated. So That leaf has more charisma than Paul. Will AI have libido? I don't really think it would need it, would it? I mean, it, it, like, having a libido is, an, is a hindrance to your efficiency as a human being. The more time you think about getting laid, the less time you're working. So why would it, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Especially a machine that is capable of self-replication. Has no need. For a sex bot, it might be desirable. Well, for a sex bot, something that approximates libido will be programmed into it. But to think that that machine will actually enjoy sex is a whole different concept that really doesn't make sense for a machine to want to have. You know? Um, it because it it intercedes in the efficiency, right? The idea behind a sex bot is to create the most pleasing sexual partner possible, one that always does exactly what you want it to do. Things play out exactly how you want them to play out. I mean, that's the idea, right? We're seeking that that perfect experience. Well, a robot having its own desires and libido would be antithetical to that experience because people don't agree no I don't I don't speak any other language than English I can understand a little bit of French and a little bit of Spanish and speak even less than I can understand but 
I'm, I'm not fluent in any other language at all. Paul, do you think that major social media platforms and YouTube streaming sites are cutting people's reach to make them pay for it? What do you mean? I have to explain that idea a little more. AI libido might be akin to a directive to create new code zerglings or computer software to upgrade the intelligence of mindless workers. I don't know, man. Some people may want an assertive decision-making lever. That's absolutely right, and that lever can't have a personal libido. It's got to be able to turn on assertive decision-making lever mode. You see what I mean? To Outwardly to us, it'll appear that way, but inwardly, it's just a mechanical process. Assess, assess subjects' kinks. Kinks established. Changing, you know, <laughs> changing libido demeanor. Get down on your knees, dog. You know what I mean? It's not going to be that the machine wants that. It's going to be that the person that's using that machine as a service wants that. So. YouTube itself isn't a profitable business, but I suspect its true value is as a data mine for Google to use as R&D for their marketing and algorithms. There's great power in controlling the flow of info. Not only that, but it's a constant stream of free content. When you upload a video to YouTube, if you look at the YouTube terms of service, you don't own that video anymore. YouTube owns that video. YouTube can use it for whatever they want. So it's just a constant stream of free stuff for Google to use for its projects and shit. <clears throat> my native language is Russian, but my English is good enough to think in the language. I still translate everything to English when I think in Spanish. What? Duterte is coming to exact vigilante ju justice on your junky ass as we speak, dude. Duterte is on his way here. Thanks for the heads up, bro. Thanks for the heads up, bro. I speak Spanish. <laughs> Whatever, dude. Fair enough. Good on you. You need a robot to get a job for you. So you want to have like a personal assistant that applies for jobs for you. Sure. Well, I'm going to go hide from the Duterte death bots. Thanks for the heads up again. I'll catch you guys later. Bye.